right, we're going to jump back into hyperbolic geometry um, for potentially the last day um, today. And we have discussed two different models um, so far inside of hyperbolic geometry, the ones we've been working with most recently. What were they? Half of you were just in my office and we were talking about what model? The Klein model. And then the, the Poincaré model was last one we did last time. And the Klein model and the Poincaré model both occur inside of a circle gamma. Um, the Klein model has chords and diameters, um, which are just specific types of chords, but chords inside of um, the circle gamma. And then when we are working inside the Poincaré model, we actually had, um, we had arcs that created perpendiculars with the edges of the circle gamma. I'm almost there, I think. There we go. And so we had this kind of images, plus we had diameters of the circle as well. And so those were our lines inside of the Poincaré model. Now here's the deal. In order for those to both be models inside of the same type of geometric system, there must be an isomorphism, um, a mapping, uh, that relates one object to the other so that you can see how they could both be images of the same descriptions. So that's where we're going to start today. We're going to talk about this isomorphism. So the isomorphism between these two models, so the Klein model and the Poincaré model, Are isomorphic. And what that means, uh, if you haven't used that word or used it recently, is that there is a one to one correspondence. It's just a little too thick. Let me try a little bit smaller. Um, a one-to-one -one correspondence between points. Of each. And lines of each. preserves incidence, betweenness, and congruence. It's one thing to say such a thing exists, it's quite another to actually figure out how it works or what it looks like. So we're actually going to talk about what that congruence, or sorry, correspondence looks like. So we're going to start with the Klein model. And consider
and Euclidean 3 space. A sphere. of the same radius. Sitting on the plane of the Klein model. I'll attempt to draw this in a minute. And tangent to it at the origin. And imagine that we project upward orthogonally the entire Klein model. onto the lower hemisphere of this sphere. Okay, so let me go back and let you write down in case you're a little Is everybody good on that screen so far? Okay, great. By this projection, the chords in the Klein model become arcs of circles orthogonal to the equator We then project stereographically from the North Pole. of the sphere to the original plane. Okay, so I'm going to 
like I said, attempt to draw this. Um, so here's, whoa, that's not what I wanted. Or that one. Okay. Here's my attempt at a sphere. And if you can imagine down below, we have the Klein model. I'll move it up here in just a second. Actually, let me do this too. Just so it looks different. Let me draw it in silver. They are... This isn't drawn well. Let me try it one more time. can imagine it drawn in like that. Can you see that well enough, that gray? Is that right? Um, they're touching at the center of the Klein model, okay? So the center of the circle itself is what's actually touching the North Pole or the South Pole, depending on how you want to describe it. South Pole sort of have drawn it in here. And so as you project upward, if you have a cord down here in your Klein model, it actually gets projected upward I'm just going to draw it in a way that I could actually convince you that that made sense, um, to a, this is totally not convincing, I don't have a good image of this, um, but it projects upward onto the sphere. If I started from the center out, I think I could do a better job. Imagine that this actually hits right here, and so let me do it straight. This actually gets projected up like this, curved. I'm, I'm pleased with that particular image. Um, Three-dimensional visualization is not my strength for sure. Um, but that's what's happening, right? So these cords actually get projected flat. This is what happens when you take the globe and you try to make it look flat. I don't know if you've ever seen different images. The whole time I'm describing this to you, I'm thinking about these pictures that I've seen. And depending on where you project stereographically down from the globe, it ends up making it look like different continents are actually bigger by comparison to other continents. And so we tend to project it from where our center of our universe, which is North America, is. And so North America ends up looking bigger because of the way we stereographically project things. Whereas if you stereographically project them um, differently, you end up with Asia or um, with Africa or whatever looking more substantially um, land mass size larger than what we actually have on our typical maps. Um, and then the same thing happens if we project down. So if we imagine taking our North Pole right here and projecting downward, you can imagine this piece coming down um, where there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. So the part that's actually hitting the equator there is reflecting down to the ideal points along the edge of our Klein model, right? The part that's in the center, if it was actually connected to the center of the circle, I didn't draw the whole chord in there, obviously, but that would actually go through, this, through the South Pole, right? So this is the correspondence that we have. Um, one additional comment before we um, change gears just a little bit. Some facts to be aware of. All models have this ability. So all models of, in particular, we're working with hyperbolic geometry. All models of hyperbolic geometry are isomorphic. And the same could be true for Euclidean geometry. All models of Euclidean geometry. are isomorphic. I did not say that Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry are isomorphic to one another, right? Just the models within their systems. Um, and maybe you've had this experience. Has anybody traveled abroad um, 
far enough that they put the picture on the front of the airplane that shows your trajectory of your plane. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Has anybody traveled overseas and seen that? Yes, some nodding heads. Um, I remember my first experience with that that I remember, uh, which was as a young adult. I had, had tra traveled overseas as a teenager. I don't remember them doing this, so maybe that's just something since then. I don't know. But um, I remember thinking, why in the world would we travel to Africa over Greenland, I think? That doesn't make any sense. Why would we do that? Um, and what you have to remember, of course, too, is that you're not traveling in a straight line, right? You're traveling in these arcs and these curves, and it doesn't always work the same way. And, of course, there's, you know, wind flow and whatever the currents and stuff to take into consideration as well. But it's not a straight line. And we think so much like we work in this straight line sort of system, and we don't. We really work more like the Poincaré model along the hemisphere than we do along the Klein model. So um, I want to talk about something that we've alluded to <coughs> once before. Um, this is still hyperbolic stuff. Um, but it's a little bit of a different um, direction. We, we mentioned, um, I don't know, two or three class periods ago that we can't measure distance the same way that we measure distance in Euclidean geometry, right? We talked about that fact because then if we did, everything would be finite distances um, and then it screws up to a couple of the axioms. I cited a couple of them um, if we actually allowed geometry to be measured in finite terms that way. So we're going to talk a little bit about that measurement next, all right? So what we need in order to do that is to talk about what's called inversion of circles. And this is going to feel like something you've done before. And I'm going to let you tell me where you've seen it. So in order to define congruence, of segments specifically we're going to look in the Poincaré model we must look at inversion in a Euclidean circle So let's define what we're talking about as we move forward doing that. Let gamma be a circle of radius r. This is a Euclidean circle, right? Okay, so this isn't the model we've been referencing, but um, be a circle, I said, of radius r. and center O. For any point P not equal to O, the inverse P prime of O, I'm sorry, of P, with respect to gamma is the unique point P prime on ray OP for which OP 
times op prime equals r squared. So let me draw the picture. Here's your center O. Here's, oops, let me draw it so that I can get the picture all the way. Here's P. There's a ray coming out like this. That's OP. And there is some other point out here, P prime. And this is my radius R. Whoops, that's a terrible R. In my circle gamma. And where have you seen it? You did it in your GeoGebra assignment, right? The one that I haven't graded. Yeah. Yeah, but I had enough of you come in that we chatted about it, so I know most of you have seen it um, at this point. This is the reference for this, okay? Now, there are some facts to be aware of. Um, so we're going to do some propositions. Some of them we're going to prove, some of them we're not. Um, some of them are, are very clearly obvious, um, some of them less so. So let's look at some propositions based on this particular picture. Yours is drawn in, but I'm going to have to switch slides. So proposition 7.1 <clears throat> has three parts to it. Part A, P is equal to P prime. Any idea when that would happen? And P and P prime would be the same thing. Yep, if it's on the edge of the circle. So this is if and only if P lies on gamma. Um, and I think from an algebra sense, you know, with the equation that was created or that we set up on the definition, that, that's pretty obvious to us, right? I think we're good with that one. Um, B, if P is interior, and you actually discovered, so to speak, some of this with GeoGebra, if P is interior, to gamma, what can you say about P prime? Yeah, then P prime is exterior to gamma. And vice versa. Thank you. And what do you suppose happens if you talk about P double prime like this? Right. It would be P itself. There's this symmetric relationship. Um, in particular, um, you also um, played with this with GeoGebra um, tools as well. Um, the closer P is to the center O, what do you think happens with P prime? No, the opposite happens actually. So over on my picture, if this point that I'm working with is here, Oh, and that's a terrible color. Let me try something a little bit lighter so it shows up. That should do it. If the point P is what I've actually marked in yellow, that distance is very small. And you think in terms of some algebra with uh, this equation right here, that other one's going to have to compensate by being much further away. Makes sense in terms of numbers? Yeah. So the closer P is to O, the further... P prime is from O. <coughs> and then, of course, the closer P is to gamma, what's going to happen? Now the same thing, right? The closer P prime will be to gamma. Okay. Seems okay so far, right? We just you actually did almost all of that in your GeoGebra stuff, so that shouldn't sound or feel foreign at this point. 
Let's look at Proposition 72. <clears throat> If P is inside gamma, then its inverse is the pole of the chord. perpendicular to line OP through P. So we'll attempt to draw the picture for that. Maybe I, maybe I have enough space. We'll see. Here's O in the center, and here's P right next to it, so to speak. And we have our line, which is way too thick, coming out here. Go with that. And somewhere out here is going to be P prime. My picture is probably going to be less than convincing since I'm just throwing the numbers and points everywhere I'm supposed to be putting them. Um, but what this is actually telling us is that we have, um, let me see where I got it here. P is inside gamma. Uh, its inverse is the pole perpendicular to OP through, yeah, okay. So we have right here um, a chord. I should draw my chord first, then it might be more convincing. Here's my chord. And here are the radii to the edges of my cord to create my pole. And my pole is going to be drawn in something like that. Everything's thick enough to hide my discrepancies, right? Uh, yeah. Um, some things to remember that you, re you should remember um, about um, some of the facts that you've seen before is that you have, of course, a 90 degree angle right there. And this is forming a 90 degree angle right here. And we're going to talk a little bit about that triangle. So that triangle that's formed has three right triangles, correct? And you've worked on some ratios with right triangles because right triangles with the same angles uh, would be similar. Agreed? You've got three similar triangles there. The angles all match because they're sharing um, at least one angle per correspondence. <coughs> and they all have the 90-degree angle, hence they share all the same angle measures. So let's take a look at proving this one because the proof is um, pretty brief. So triangle... OPT. Did I actually label letters? Probably not. Uh, T is at the top, U is at the bottom. Okay. So triangle OPT, that's this little one on the left, is similar to OTP prime, the large outside triangle. So the two triangles that I'm working with, we're going to see if I can draw them in thick enough. This is one of my triangles. That's OPT. And then here's, oh, it's going to be bad, but the blue one on the outside is the other one. Okay, did everybody watch me draw that enough to know where my two triangles were? Okay, good, because the picture's kind of small. All right, so triangle OPT is similar to triangle OTP prime. <clears throat> and OT is equal to the radius R. So we can actually set up a ratio. That's what some more triangles give us, is they give us ratios. 
So OP is to R as R is to OP prime. It's a side over hypotenuse. Each of those ratios are okay, each of the sides of the triangles that are in similarity across uh, or uh, as compared to the radius. Um, or sorry, the hypotenuse. And if we cross multiply, we get that the, then that OP times OP prime is actually equal to the radius squared, which was our definition for for this uh, descript for what we're working with. Yeah. All right. Trying to decide if I have space for the, pr the proposition and the proof on the same slide. I don't think I do, so I'll just continue with the proposition here. All right, so the next proposition, Proposition 7.3, says the following. If P is outside gamma, let Q be the midpoint of the segment OP. Let sigma be the circle with center Q. And radius O Q I shouldn't have a line above it. Equal Q P. Then sigma cuts gamma. in two points, T and U. Line PT and line PU Our tangent to gamma and the inverse P prime, the inverse of P. is the intersection of TU and OP. felt like that was really thick the whole time I was writing it. It was, wasn't it? Okay, let's draw a picture of this. You guys got everything written down at this point? Okay. Alright, so draw your in, in a circle gamma. <clears throat> With center O. And it says that Q, no, no, P is outside of gamma. So let's draw P outside of gamma. So 
So here's OP. And Q is the midpoint of that. Let me make it so that it doesn't end up having the image that is like falling on the circle itself. I'll draw it here. Okay, so Q is the midpoint of this particular segment. So here's Q. Very good Q, but it's okay. All right, let me make sure I'm following the way that this is described. Sigma is going to be the circle with center Q and radius OQ um, or QP. So we're going to create another circle. Oh my, not that thick. Okay, that's believable, mostly. Everybody good with that? It's a circle with those endpoints. Sigma will cut gamma. Well, not that I have either of them labeled, but here's sigma, here's gamma, into two points, T and U. So let's label those next. Here's T at the top. Here's point U at the bottom. Line PT and line PU are tangent to gamma. And the inverse of P prime, or sorry, the inverse P prime of P is the intersection of T, U, and O, P. So, oh, I didn't get T, U drawn in yet. Sorry about that. We'll do that one next. This point uh, where that's creating that intersection right here would be P prime. Okay, so far so good? All right, so let's actually prove this one. Try and do it on this page. All right, gamma and sigma meet in two points. By the circular continuity principle. Uh, just for a reference point, that's on page 130. As O and P are diametrically opposite on sigma, Angle OTP and angle OUP are right angles. <coughs> Here. 
hence PT, line PT, and line PU are tangent to gamma. Letting P inverse or P prime be OP segment intersect TU as a segment, we see that the inverse. of P prime is P. By Proposition 7-2 from just a moment ago, therefore, P prime is also the inverse of P. Sometimes a proof like this is called proof by construction. We constructed it to have certain properties um, and all the other things fall into place exactly like we intended for them to be. So how do we construct P lines joining these together? <coughs> This is how to construct the p-lines joining two ideal points. So proposition 7.4 says the following. Let t and u be points on gamma. not diametrically opposite. That means they don't have a diameter between them. And let P be the pole of TU. Then we have PT congruent to PU angle PTU congruent to angle PUT Line OP perpendicular, perpendicular to line TU and the circle Delta. Okay, sorry, I haven't used it today. I'm losing my mind. Delta with center P and radius PT 
equal to PU. Cuts. Gamma orthogonally. At T and U. I'm going to do a proof by picture on this one, okay? So let's diagram what we have going on. We have our circle. Oops. Circle. Center O. Uh, let's see. We have T and U that are not diametrically opposite. Let's get a different color. It'll work. And there's a segment, of course, that connects them. P is outside our circle. Um, it's the pole of chord T U. So again, let's see if we can draw that in, roughly speaking. This would be point P. Something like that. Um, these angles that are formed over here on the edges, of course, are right angles um, because they're tangent lines that you're using to form them. So, a few details. Triangle. <coughs> OTP is congruent to triangle OUP. Everybody good with that piece? Okay, good deal. Um, that's going to make side PT congruent to side PU, right? That's going to infer that piece, which will then also tell us that we have, oops, I should say triangle, left on my triangle, triangle PTU is isosceles. Which will then imply that angle P T U is congruent to angle P U T. We also then know that O P bisects angle P, which implies that O P is perpendicular. I ran out of space, didn't I? I should say is perpendicular. Okay, let me try one more time. To T U. Proof I picture mostly because we constructed it to be that way. Let's see where we are. All right, Proposition 7.5. Oops. Let P be a point not on gamma. and not the center of gamma.
and let delta be a circle through P. delta cuts gamma orthogonally if and only if delta passes through the inverse P prime of P with respect to gamma. So let's note the following. Thus, we may construct line between any two points P and Q inside gamma or P inside gamma and Q on gamma. By constructing, we can do this, that is by constructing The circle through P, P prime, Q, which will also contain Q prime. try and draw this with the arcs. This is a rather limiting environment in this particular app, but we'll try anyway. All right, so here's my circle gamma. We have our center, oops, O, oh, and we have a point P that is inside the circle. Um, and not O itself. So here's P. Oops. We have, let's see, what did I get set up first? Construct the P line between each two points P and Q inside gamma, so I need Q inside as well. So P and Q and 
And then we have a perpendicular drawn in here. P prime is over here. And Q prime is further around as well. And we can use the arc to create I've got limited capabilities, but purple, why not? The arc that creates this. And we'll continue around. Here's my 90 degree angle here, and oops, over there. Let's define it anyway. All right, definition. Let A and B be points inside gamma. And let PQ and Q, I should say, be the ideal points of the P line joining AB. The cross ratio is, so notation, segment AB, segment PQ, or the distance, AB PQ equals, sorry, I'm going to have to take this up just a little bit to have more space. distance from A to P times the distance from B to Q divided by the distance from B to P times the distance from A to Q. And a note about this, these are the Euclidean segment lengths. It's terrible. Okay, you put the instrument links. <clears throat> All right, let me talk a little bit about this cross ratio. Um, we'll pick up with the cross ratio information next time. Um, and I would like for you to do one more piece of information um, for me as um, a homework and a little bit of reading over this. Just one homework thing. It's not a whole bunch of them, okay? I had a whole bunch of them last night, which I never collected yet, but I'll get that. Um, some notes about the cross ratio before I give you that, though. As B, oh, I didn't draw your picture, but I will. As B gets closer to A, this distance, this cross ratio, A, B, P, Q, approaches 1. So... As a reference, I need a brief picture. Wow, I have too many icons right now going on. So here's, roughly speaking, what we're talking about. Here's A, B, along the edges are P and Q. That's where the locations were as they were defined. Um, these are 90 degree angles, this is a P line. Right, lines in the Poincaré model. Um, as B gets closer to P,
with a fixed, so A is not moving. The cross ratio ABPQ approaches infinity. These are numerical statements about the um, lengths from the previous slide. As B uh, gets closer to P, I said P before, this one's Q, my bad. As B gets closer to Q, again with A fixed, the cross ratio approaches zero. And it becomes, or is becoming, less than one as soon as A star B star Q. That is B passes A as it's getting closer to Q. Okay, there's a little bit more on this. Let me kind of just pause right here. There's not a lot more. I think I have probably five minutes, but I can't do everything in the next five minutes. That's really going to take me 10. So let me give you a couple of details. We'll finish up this little bit of the lesson and move on into the next section next time. But what I need from you is I need for you guys to, hang on, this is wrong. Too many pages out. To do a couple of things for your homework for this evening. So one problem, just one. This is on page 360, and it's problem P10, okay, page 60, problem P10. And then I would also like for you to do one additional thing that I haven't asked really to do much this semester, like not at all. So you're going to take a look at your book, and you're actually going to read a little bit of it, okay? So yeah, Seth's like, read a book, what are we talking about? You're going to read Fatland too, that's another book you're going to read. Um, it's one chapter. So I'd like for you to read chapter 8 and be ready to discuss it. Oops. So I will finish the last five-ish or so minutes of um, this material next time. Um, and then we will um, jump right into chapter eight discussion um, and move on into transformational geometry next, all right?